Good afternoon from Singapore and a big hello to everyone as well who might be dialing in from other places on the globe. Uh, thank you and welcome to today's session where we'll be talking about sustainable development in APEC, innovating for energy efficiency. My name is Wei Min from SG Innovate and for those who may know, SG Innovate is a government-backed deep tech investor and company builder whose mission is to help entrepreneurial scientists build deep tech startups that are looking to solve big global problems. Our work also involves in building a global community of leaders, thinkers, and doers to drive and scale up deep tech innovations in areas such as AI, healthcare, quantum tech, and autonomous technology across various industries. Today, we are most glad to have partnered with TechNote Global to talk a little bit about the topic of energy and being sustainable in the APEC region. Now, the term sustainability has been a hot topic in recent years where more and more company has been exploring greener means to their operations and businesses. And that actually branches off to many areas, uh, you know, like using alternative energies, uh, materials, and today more particularly, our speakers will cover a little bit more on energy efficiency and responsible consumption of energy. For today's webinar, we also encourage for all attendees to share with us your thoughts on the topic and interact with our speakers by posting your questions on the Q&A tab uh, located at the bottom panel of your screen. Otherwise, feel free to just say hi and do a quick shout out from where you're from using the chat box below. With no further ado, do allow me to pass the time to Huiying Yap, Senior Manager, Venture Investing from SG Innovate to kickstart the session. Huiying, please. Thank you, Wei-Min. Um, I'm Huiying from the Venture Investing team of SG Innovate and I will be moderating today's panel discussion on sustainable development in APEC, innovating for energy efficiency. Um, energy efficiency has always been identified as one of um, the enabling tools that can support our energy transition efforts um, towards decarbonizing the industry. And, and that is not no different in Singapore, where it is one of the key pillars of Singapore's energy story to meet our carbon reduction targets. In today's session, we hope to take a closer look at the role of innovative energy efficiency solutions um, in achieving our carbon reduction goals. We hope to dive um, deeper to understand the current market trends, opportunities, barrier to deployment, and what can be done to drive adoption and meet various sustainable development goals. We are very privileged to have three very experienced industry experts with us today for this panel discussion. Uh, Ms. Miriam Akun, Director, Sustainable Solutions from NG Impact. Mr. Stanley Ng, Program Director, Southeast Asia, New Energy Nexus. And Mr. Sai Krishnan, CEO and co-founder of Sensorflow. To our audience here today, again, you know, if we hope to answer some of the questions along the way as we address the various topics related to energy efficiency and broadly the topic of sustainable energy solutions. Feel free to post any questions you have on the Q&A box below and we will try our best to answer them. So without further ado, let's jump right in for a quick round of introduction by our panelists. Um, maybe let me first um, invite Miriam, if you could start us off, um, and then followed by Stanley and, and Sai. Um, give us a bit, brief background about yourself, the organization you're from, and your role in your organization. Uh, thank you. So hi, everyone. I'm Miriam. Um, I'm a director for NG Impact uh, in Singapore. Um, NG Impact is uh, an entity of NG, the, the big utility company, who is uh, um, focusing mostly on sustainability transformation and decarbonization of our clients. So we really help our clients uh, design and plan for their decarbonization for, from footprint assessment all the way to implementation. Um, and of course, energy efficiency is always one of the levers we look at when we help our clients uh, decarbonize. Um, and on my side, my background is more on the renewable energy side. I've been working for a bit more than 10 years in that space before, before joining NG Impact. Really happy to be here today. Thank you, Miriam. Hi, everyone. I'm Stanley. I'm the program director for New Energy Nexus in Southeast Asia. So, New Energy Nexus, we're a global organization, a nonprofit. Um, and our main thing is to enable climate and energy entrepreneurship around the world. That means different things in different countries, but a combination of um, funding, combination of business training in the form of accelerator programs, um, and then also scale-up programs, helping um, startups match with corporate partners, um, enabling them to do more projects, 
um, and be successful. And that's what our organization overall does. A big focus um, going forward is definitely energy efficiency, industrial energy efficiency, um, and transportation, all of these um, high carbon emitting sectors. Happy to be here, thanks. Thank you. Sam. All right, so I'll go next. Uh, so I'm Sai, the co-founder and CEO at TensorFlow. Um, our mission is to make every building more productive, energy efficient and sustainable. Uh, and we've been focused on hotels and hospitality as our market. So we built a full stack IoT solution that automates um, HVAC or air conditioning and heating um, for these sort of guest rooms in hotels, which is about 70% of their floor area. Uh, and so what we're seeing as an impact is re reducing the energy consumption and the carbon offset of these hotels by 30 to 50%. Uh, and uh, what we managed to do is build a solution that's very easily retrofitted. So it takes us five minutes to install a typical hotel room. Uh, and we've devised a business model where hotels pay off the savings that they generate. Um, so there isn't like an upfront investment. It's very much a sort of partnership approach that we've taken, which means um, we can enter the market and actually offer these solutions for people willing to sort of become more sustainable and more sort of carbon friendly uh, in that process. So very happy to be here. Yeah, Th thank you so much for the introduction. So you have touched a bit about, you know, um, what the next question that I would like to, to um, channel to our panelists here, you know, on, on what constitute um, energy efficiency solutions, right? So I think we can jump on that um, um, next. Um, in this case, perhaps, you know, we can start with you and perhaps um, also tap on um, Miriam and um, Stanley's experience. I think firstly, it's helpful for us to, to um, set the context as to what constitute energy efficiency and, and why is that important? So perhaps we can start with you first, I. Yeah, um, so I'm very glad I offered you a segue there. So, thank you, Lynn. But, uh, you know, if you look at sort of energy efficiency, obviously there are many components to it. Like there's the whole sort of production side, the sort of demand side, and then, of course, within the building, um, also the sort of localized supply of, you know, like uh, cooling or heating or any of the other sort of services. Um, and so for SensorFlow, uh, we, you know, particularly focus on the demand side of things. So what we do is use data to understand the environment we are in and automate or reduce the demand, um, you know, completely sort of um, away from the human uh, touch. So we know that, you know, by looking at a building sort of operations, its occupancy rate, maybe its humidity, temperature, we can then sort of understand what the real-time demand of the building is and then adjust parameters like the HVAC consumption uh, or even like, you know, turning off certain services um, within the building to save energy. Uh, and so we've been targeting hotels mostly because we saw a big opportunity there with the amount of variation that happens within a day. So if you take a typical hotel, um, you know, 70% of that floor area is guest rooms and guest rooms are so dynamic. Like people are there um, you know, between certain hours and then they leave the rooms and leave everything on in there. So, you know, your air conditioning, your lighting, everything is just sort of wasting energy. Uh, and what we are able to do is detect those situations and then automate, you know, like the systems like the uh, fan coil units or the chillers uh, to then sort of reduce that consumption. Uh, and so this is, this is obviously just one part of it. Mm -hmm. um, where, how you produce that energy and then sort of how you automate the big system, I'm sure Miriam and Stanley have a lot more to say on that. So. Thanks, Sai. Um, and yes, maybe I can add a bit on on the on the way we look at energy efficiency as part of the you know the wider uh, solution to decarbonize. So so the way we look at it is that energy efficiency is usually the first lever uh, that you would use when um, companies are looking at decarbonizing because it has both uh, of course a carbon impact but also a cost impact. Usually, uh, by implementing those those measures, uh, companies would also uh, make uh, economical, uh, I mean, cost uh, cost efficient investment and, and save potentially um, energy costs. Um, and, and according to the International Energy Agency, uh, actually 40% of carbon abatement by 2040 could come from energy efficiency measures. So we see that as a very, um, let's say, important uh, lever to to activate and to work on as the first step. But indeed, this has to kind of um, be uh, embedded in a wider uh, let's say, decarbonization plan that also looks at the energy supply side and at potentially um, other type of, of decarbonization. 
Great. And um, yeah, just to add on, um, when we support our startups, we always ask them like who, who your target audience is or who your customer is, right? So we usually bucket these into the the smallest group, the residential, right? In your home, you maybe have like a hundred, couple hundred dollars as your energy bill. So solutions would be things that are completely scalable. How do you um, target a thousand homes? Like um, how do you work with utilities to then target their customers and enable this like mass um, adoption of energy efficiency. Um, second is the commercial, the buildings that you see in the CBD, the malls. How do you, um, as I mentioned, reduce the HVAC usage? Um, and uh, that for Southeast Asia, that's a big focus. Um, then you have your industrial where you, in um, Singapore, there's only like a few, couple hundred, um, you know, but in other countries, um, you have very different manufacturing processes and you have uh, food manufacturers that require cold chain, right? How do you um, help them to be more efficient with their energy usage? Industrial is uh, a lot of times very overlooked because in any um, ecosystem or country, they um, use about up to 30% of the entire uh, country's energy production, right? Um, mm -hmm. For, for these few companies. So um, when we target those, we can get a lot um, of bang for the buck when we do energy efficiency. And then uh, there's also transportation and then shipping, which um, obviously um, we're trying to electrify and mm -hmm. efficiency is tied to that as well. Right, right. Thank you for, for the sharing. Uh, I think from what I hear is, you know, there's a lot of potential across different sectors and, and Stanley, where you're coming from is, is to first target or attack um, the industrial because, um, you know, energy consumption is highest in, in that space, right? I think inside where you're coming from is your potential in, in the hotel and, and the tourism space. Um, Miriam, I'm curious from your point of view, is there any particular sector that, that you know, in your course of work that you think um, NG is also looking at particularly when it comes to energy efficiency? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think uh, what we have seen um, so far as an interesting sector uh, to look at energy efficiency. So obviously I would concur with Sai on the uh, building uh, environment or any uh, type of uh, real estate, whether it's a, it's a hotel or campus or, or you know, any precinct where you have a lot of buildings and, and, and you need to operate that, malls, retail, et cetera. Um, the other one that we have seen uh, acting quite uh, quite actively on these energy efficiency measures is the tech sector and data center uh, uh, sectors mm. specifically, um, because for them it's really uh, I mean they are a very uh, energy intensive sector and so optimizing their energy efficiency use uh, what they call the PUE is is really key uh, in terms of both um, a carbon footprint but also profitability. And that's a, a commitment to our that client as well. Right, right. Th thanks for that. And um, Miriam, you also pointed out on um, the potential of um, energy efficiency um, solutions. I think you mentioned about the 40% um, abatement potential reported by IEA. I'm, I'm curious in your course of work, um, also Stanley and Sai, right? What kind of um, reductions are we seeing in the market today? Um, I think yeah, so that, perhaps, yeah, you can share a bit as to you know, what you're seeing also, right, in international solutions for your customers. Uh, should I go first? Uh, Mir Miriam first, yeah. Yeah, okay, great, perfect. Uh, yeah, so we have been um, observing, what's, what's quite interesting is that even on site where uh, clients think that, you know, they have already implemented some of the measures, when, once you, you really uh, do a proper audit uh, to identify what can be done and, and quantify that, what we realize is that sometimes you, we can have between uh, 10 to 30% savings uh, that we observe on the site. And, and this is across uh, multiple type of sectors. The manufacturing sector is one of them. Um, the data center is another and, uh, and the, the campus I was mentioning earlier as well. So we really see that, uh, I mean, that very strong potential uh, once uh, you really do, do a thorough assessment of um, bringing savings. And I think what's interesting is also how do you look at those, uh, those um, the savings and, and the investment you need to make because um, yes, it's true that it comes with some cost at the beginning, but then the savings is on the lifetime of the project. So, so it's, it really has 
um, a, a long-term impact. And it's something that, that you can also stagger uh, in the way you implement it. So what we, what we look at with our clients is to help them decide what to start with. So what are the low hanging fruits and then move maybe to the more transformative uh, solutions that are maybe a bit more expensive, a bit of longer payback, but still bring some savings and, and so move, move, move forward like that. Um, so it's, it's both about uh, doing an exhaustive uh, identification of those measures but also planning them in a in a, an economic and, and optimized uh, fashion. Yeah, I can maybe sort of uh, add on to sort of what we saw in the industry uh, yeah. with COVID, right? Especially, um, so uh, you know, I was talking about sort of how the environment impacts the demand, right? And one of the key things about hotels is occupancy rates, like mm -hmm. how much of your building actually has you know guests. So typically. Pre-COVID, for most of the hotels that we worked with, you would see occupancy rates anywhere between 70 to 90 percent, um, which mm -hmm. is you know, considered pretty good. Um, and what that meant is, you know, like most of your building is operating as per normal. It has these sort of occupants, they're using the systems, they're moving around. And so the heat load, the sort of, uh, you know, frequency at which certain things like, you know, um, uh, the HVAC system or the water is being used in those rooms. They're all sort of, you know, normal. And then once COVID hit, obviously occupancy rates start yeah. to go down. So you start seeing like, you know, single digit occupancy rates in certain places. And in certain cases, the hotels had to close down. And from there, we saw two new things emerge. The first was, you know, how to actually maintain a hotel, um, while you're going through a low occupancy period because you know you take for granted things like you know consistent use of a particular mm -hmm. room but if you don't use it consistently you have issues like humidity buildup which can cause mold formation you have legionnaires um, legionella uh, sort of in the water um, you also have sort of you know dust collection happening in sort of you know the fan call units um, and then when you sort of recommission the room or re, you know sort of bring the room back into action, you start to see a whole lot of problems on the maintenance side. Um, but what was also interesting is how a lot of the, specifically the HVAC systems were designed for high usage. So when you go into low occupancy modes, you actually don't see the energy consumption come down you know, in correlation. So just because you're at 30% occupancy doesn't mean you're spending one third the energy of 90% you know, occupancy. Um, it actually, it's a completely different sort of correlation. And we saw that in some cases it can remain the same uh, as, you know, like double occupancy rates. So you might be having only 30% occupancy that week, but your energy costs are the same as 60% occupancy. And so the hotels got really alarmed because they weren't sure what was going on. Like, how is this possible? Like, you know, isn't it supposed to come down? And that's where you start to see like, you know, there's a the base energy consumption, but there's also mm -hmm. like how you allocate rooms to your guests play a really big part in what energy you use. And so we actually use this data now to allocate rooms better. So when a hotel now has a you know, set of bookings for the next couple of weeks, mm -hmm. we take that data and we actually tell them, you know, which particular rooms they should allocate guests to so that they can minimize the energy consumption for that occupancy rate. Mm -hmm. And so this has come out of purely out of COVID because we saw this from the data let me use that data to actually build a product that helps them, you know, open post-COVID in a much more scalable way, much more operationally efficient way. Right. So that's, that's a very interesting point. Um, I'm not sure if Sandy has anything to, to add on this before I, I jump on to this um, COVID discussion. Yeah, uh, well, we can move on to that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I, I think the next thing that I thought would be interesting to is, is to look at, you know, how... Um, the industry has changed over the last um, five years, right? And particularly in the last one and a half years or so with the COVID pandemic. Um, because I think I've seen a report by the IEA published last year that has highlighted that the global primary energy intensity, which is a key indicator of how efficiently um, world economy and activities, uh, energy usage, um, has seen less than 1% improvement in, the, in 2020, which is um, the lowest since 2010. So which, which means that we have seen um, a, a, a very minimal improvement in energy efficiency efforts um, during this COVID period. So I, I just wanted to get a view and, and curious to hear from um, our panels here today on how that has impacted the industry largely, um, energy efficiency deployment, and also from implementation perspective. 
Yeah, I, I think I can just start quickly with this. Um, you know, we used to run these regional energy efficiency programs in 2020. We did one with ADB Ventures, the Building Energy Challenge. And, you know, the idea was to take global solutions and deploy them in various countries in, throughout Southeast Asia, working with commercial partners. Um, and then COVID hit. So, you know, a, a lot of them had great conversations. They're like, let's do this pilot together. Let's start uh, testing the solutions. And then suddenly nobody can travel. Um, so the ones that actually lucked out are the ones that were operating domestically um, in the country where the commercial partners were. So it, it, it grows the need for um, a lot of uh, homegrown solutions, domestic solutions that can work together immediately due to just the physical, um, you know, proximity. Um, so that's like one impact uh, we've seen from our business. Any input, um, Miriam or? Yeah, Sarah? maybe I want to add to that that uh, we. I mean, I think I think the there is a simple explanation, right? The the companies have set targets and they are supposed to achieve this energy efficiency or like the energy savings targets, let's say. And if there is no occupancy or if people are not going to the office or whatever, like COVID related reason, uh, obviously those targets are much easier to achieve. So so I guess that's why. Um, uh, the, the, the measures to really actually save energy in the long term were not implemented because the, the energy savings were still achieved by, by just by the fact that the economy slowed down. Um, this being said, we also observed that some of our, of our clients or, or people we were talking to uh, in certain sector um, were actually using that time to, uh, to retrofit or to do uh, more significant changes to their, to their site uh, in order to bring that energy efficiency. Um, and, and to capture those savings on the long term. Um, and, and, and there are also uh, some, cli some clients that are now considering that this 2020 should be the rebaseline of what they are actually supposed to achieve. So uh, even if, if like maybe not a lot of measures have been implemented in 2020 itself, mm -hmm. the energy saving achieved, some of those companies will still try to carry forward the savings on the long term. And, and ultimately uh, it could have contributed to to uh, higher uh, saving potential um, between now and 2030, I would say. Right, right. Yeah, I can also sort of talk a bit about um, what we saw as the, you know, like the knee-jerk reaction uh, with sort of COVID and then after 12 months of people reflecting yeah. on themselves, you know, what happened, right? So the, the knee-jerk was, let's stop paying every single subscription maintenance contract and <laughs> <laughs> tell people that, oh yeah, sorry, we can't do this. We don't have cash flow. It's completely yeah. understand. Right? Um, you're trying to save your business. You're trying to make sure that you can actually pay your staff their last salary before you furlough them, whatever, because massive uncertainties. Uh, and then soon, you know, like a lot of the owners and the operators realized that, okay, I mean, it's not that, you know, we're never going to open up. We're going to open up at some point. So what can we do better to open up in a way that, you know, uh, is actually a bit closer to where we want it to be maybe five years from now? Mm -hmm. And for a lot of hotels, uh, that was just digitizing their operations, mm -hmm. right? Like they looked at their operations and they know this. They know that they have massive staff overheads. They know that the energy savings can be a lot better. But, you know, like the pre-COVID sentiment was always, if I have money, I'm going to spend it on marketing yep. or sales to get more sort of customers in, to get could get more of the guests away from my competi competitive brands. Mm -hmm. And so that mindset is now starting to change because they now realize that it's no longer just about how much I can attract, but, you know, can I actually break even at yeah. a lower occupancy rate? Can I actually increase my gross operating profit? But should I be in the sort of, you know, the, the way to look at this from the beginning, but obviously that's not how most people think. That's not how most operators think. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this whole pandemic has changed that viewpoint. Like it's very much become a question of how can I run my operations a lot uh -huh. more efficiently than before? Um, uh -huh. And also how can I sort of, you know, cater to the changing expectation from my guests? Um, so the whole contactless, you know, journey, right. that's also pushed guests to expect something different from hotels. 
they mm-hmm. no longer want to, you know, like have this queuing experience when they check in or like waiting for a long time to check out. It's just already happening in the bigger brands, but you're starting to see that now with the smaller brands as well. Um, and the reason why it was already possible with bigger brands is they had a lot more staff so they can, you know, turn over rooms quicker or like cater to certain needs and changes on check-in. Like maybe I want a higher floor closer to the elevator or suddenly I feel like smoking, you know, these things do happen right before checking. You take up smoking two minutes before. And so like, it's, it's these kind of changes that, you know, prior to COVID, like only the big guys could cater for in a very quick way and guests would feel happy. But then now, like when you start to look at, you know, what's stopping the independent hotels or the smaller chains, uh, it's very much about, you know, like minimize the amount of staff they have is very minimal. Uh-huh. That means uh-huh. they need to be more efficient. And so where they can build those efficiencies is automating a lot of these processes so, you know, me knowing sort of when the guest arrives, like, you know, guests right. can just have this Uber-like experience. They can go onto their phone, let the hotel know they're probably going to arrive around 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. Maybe they are waiting for an early check-in on that day. And then the ho- housekeeping operations, the maintenance operations, everybody can prepare those rooms. When you come to the front desk, you don't need to pick up anything. You just go straight to your room. Like, it's like ordering your car. Like, it's like an Uber right. thing, right? Like, you just go straight to your room, you open, you get in there. That solves like a whole set of problems, which, you know, b- people didn't care about until recently. Uh, and then, of course, like how you allocate those rooms, you know, can be done more efficiently as well, which we talked about with energy efficiency, obviously, you know, like picking the right rooms, picking the most energy efficient rooms, uh, all of that matters. Uh, and so, like, I-, I personally think hotels have pulled forward their digitization strategy mm-hmm. by at least five years. From the looks of it, like I know how slow the industry used to be, it's yeah. moving at a much faster pace now. So this is the one good thing I would say that came out of this. Yeah, yeah. and Sai, I mean, I don't know if you agree, but I think it's also because uh, it was unoccupied. So they had to focus their effort. And exactly. Something Where do I and, put and my energy, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they could also uh, probably crash test, crash test some things a bit more work on the site and, and do these things exactly. that are required to implement all these sensors yeah. and, and digitalization solutions. So so I guess that, that accelerated also because of the lack of occupancy and we see the same trend in airports or, or this type of, of you know um, absolutely yeah sector where where you had like massive reduction of, uh, of you had thinking time basically. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's that's really great to know and I'm happy to know that, you know, at least I think from, from um solutions provider point of view, right, it, it has provided some form of opportunities as well um for, for companies to really look into that. Um I, I think I would like to jump next, you know, into um understanding a bit more um, you know, um what are other um barriers to um deployment or adoption of the technology that you guys have seen in the market today. And how should, you know, we address some of these challenges? How can we get more people to be more aware, adopt more solutions? Anyone want to take this first? <laughs> I'll be quiet for a bit. I'll let the other just... <laughs> I, I can start. Um, so we see ourselves as like sort of an ecosystem builder, right? Um, and our job is to enable all these companies, companies like size to be successful, right? That means helping to tackle some policy barriers, uh, financing barriers. Um, A lot of times it's like figuring out business models uh, for younger companies and then also technology, right? So for all four of those things, like we're actively thinking of different ways where we engage other organizations that maybe specialize on that to um, figure out how we can kind of take advantage and, and, and further move the market forward in terms of energy efficiency, technology adoption. So just as an example, um, in the Philippines, we're planning this um, ESCO accelerator. So it's an accelerator for energy efficiency uh, service on technology companies um, and taking advantage of the fact that they just um, last year, a couple of years ago, passed this energy efficiency um, law that mandates like different companies of a certain size having like an energy auditor, an energy audit annually, and then the larger companies having an energy manager, right? So um, that really drives, can drive the market forward. And then um, whether these companies and um, solutions can get proper financing local financing um, for these solutions, 
um, to be able to do bigger projects, do more projects um, that we're also working on as well. Right. Um, and, and on our side, I would say that the, the challenges we have observed are actually uh, challenges that, that uh, companies are facing whenever they are trying to look at their decarbonization uh, you know, strategy and, and targets. So just to give you a bit of context, um, we have done a survey last year and, and what we realized is that 60% uh, of companies in the region uh, still don't have decarbonization targets in place mm -hmm. or don't know how to achieve their, their decarbonization uh, targets. And the, and the main challenges around that, and those apply not only for energy efficiency, but for, for the rest of, of decarbonization solutions, are the fact that um, companies often lack the capabilities or the expertise internally um, to, um, to really implement the solutions and to identify first and then implement the solution to decarbonize, energy efficiency being one of them, and what, what is the right technology to implement uh, given the, the wide uh, you know, choices they have. Um, so that, that capability gap or expertise gap is, is the first challenge or first barrier. Mm -hmm. I would say that the second one is the, the scale. Um, how do you make uh, this transformation at speed and at scale? And, and for energy efficiency, I think that's a, that's a very important one because it's often like brought back just to the, you know, the site responsibility. So each site would have the responsibility to implement their own solutions. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a harmonization of what is implemented and you might not capture the full value of the savings and the decarbonization uh, achievement that you could get from, from those measures. Um, and, and I would say that the third one that we uh, usually uh, observe is um, the financing of those solutions. So how do you uh, access uh, financing to actually implement um, decarbonization solution, whether it's energy efficiency or renewable energy or other type of solutions, because this comes with a cost and, and some companies might not have necessarily a budget for that. And so then it's about thinking about more innovative business model, um, like mm -hmm. as a service type of model, where you can actually implement those solutions at scale on behalf of your customer across different sites. Um, and therefore accelerate that transformation towards uh, a, a faster decarbonization. So from sort of um, my side, I completely agree with sort of, um, you know, all of the comments, especially on sort of financing. Yep. What we've seen is, uh, you know, like most of the operators, they have these, you know, targets. And when you go and speak to the people in charge of achieving those targets, you ask them, hey, what's the budget like? And the usual answer is they don't really know <laughs> because they haven't had that conversation with sort of, you know, their boss. Uh, and so what we, what we see is a good thing about going sustainable is that it can be very profitable for you as a business. Mm -hmm. And you just need to work around sort of how you structure that, um, right? Like in terms of you can either do like hardware leasing, um, yep. you can do like installment plans, you know, across a certain period. Um, but the, the key thing here is proving that ROI very quickly, which means you're mm -hmm. able to show the value from, you know, from the product itself. Uh, and then with that as the basis, you can, you know, actually sort of overcome this issue. And over time, I'm hoping that, you know, we get more and more financiers focused on, you know, partnering with companies like us where, you know, they can also get a piece of that um, sort of, you know, profits, but also they're doing the right thing. Like, you know, they're putting money behind ESG initiatives which actually go a long way, not only for their fund, but also for sort of, you know, what they're trying to achieve as an organization. So I think this part of the puzzle is still relatively new, at least in Asia. Um, I know that in certain parts of Europe and states, like we do see a lot more sort of maturity in how this is being approached. But um, here in Asia, there's actually a big opportunity. A lot of the buildings are, mm -hmm. you know, inefficient and we can sort of improve that. Um, and so partnering with the right set of financial um, advices and structured financing can really, really help there. Right. That's great. That's great to know. And, and specific to, to financing, right? I'm just curious to find out, um, are there any schemes um, in, in the market today or grants that can support some of this um, implementation or deployment? So from our side, we've seen um, a couple of productivity grants from the government of Singapore. Like there's definitely those that you can sort of tap on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but sort of uh, when you look beyond Singapore, like 
in general Southeast Asia, like it's right. not as prevalent. So we, in those scenarios, we either do the financing ourselves or we work with like a third party financier who um, you know, provides us the sort of uh, capital to then go and install and then we pay them back with interest. So that's right. kind of how we've been doing it. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, and maybe to complement there. Um, so as you know, um, as part of the Singapore Green Plan, uh, the government has uh, a target to have 80% of new buildings to be super low energy buildings by 2030, mm -hmm. and 80% of uh, for which they should improve the energy efficiency compared to their 20, uh, 25 baseline. Um, and so um, in order to achieve that, um, the, the government has indeed put in place a grant in Singapore. So it's, it's EDB uh, resource efficiency grant um, for energy that, that, uh, that they have uh, implemented and that companies can tap on to to implement some of those solutions. Uh, but I agree that it's very Singapore specific and not necessarily Southeast Asia. Yeah. Uh, or yeah. it, um, and, and yes, there are alternative business models that can be implemented. So for example, we are working currently with one of our clients globally, where we actually front the investment in all their energy efficiency measures, and then they, they, they pay us the, the electricity. And so the savings are, are kind of captured through that. And so that's, that's the type of business model that, that can be uh, implemented to to make it easier for company to implement without having to invest capex um, uh, at early on to, to really uh, save energy and, and implement the solution recommended. Interesting, interesting. Uh, yeah, just, just to add on, that's exactly what it is. I mean, the performance contracting and ESCO type model, um, many places in Southeast Asia isn't really happening on a, on a mass scale, right? Like, and, you know, it, it, it has to do with like the understanding of like local financial institutions. Like, are they, have they done these projects before? Are they like how well versed they are, right? They're still getting used to like lending for solar projects. And then maybe like, ho hopefully we're trying to push like energy efficiency um, to be next, right? To, to understand that like they can get um, good, decent returns, like, you know, even better than renewables, right? So um, that's something we're, we're always trying to, to educate and push. Right, Th thank you so much. I think that's great to, to know that, you know, they are also learning specifically on innovation related to business model as well as um, I think financing plans on how we can structure to make this more um, financially viable for, for um, the consumer at this part of the world. Um, that brings me to another point on innovation, which is also one question that has been posed um, here. Um, I'll open this to the floor, right? Um, from your point of view, what has been the most groundbreaking innovation for energy efficiency that you have seen in the market today? Size startup. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> I, think, I think it's an interesting one because what we usually see uh, when we look at energy efficiency is that a lot of the measures you can start implementing are not necessarily rocket science, right? It's, yeah. it's changing your, your lighting, it's, it's uh, improving the efficiency of your uh, cooling system through digitalization or through sensors or things like that. So, so the, the, the technology in itself is not, is not that complicated, mm -hmm. uh, but it's really about like uh, knowing how I mean, which one to select and how much saving it will bring, bring you and how do you finance it rather than, than the techn technology itself. Right, uh, right. As I said, we have seen some innovation um, in the data center space, especially around the cooling technologies for mm -hmm. centers because it's a very, um, you know, cooling is, is very important um, in this kind of, of, uh, of assets uh, to maintain the servers at a certain temperature and in a trop tropical climate, uh, Maintaining that temperature is obviously much more difficult than, than in other countries. And therefore, uh, there are a lot of innovation around liquid cooling solutions, um, mm -hmm. tropical environment that are being explored by the data center sector together with the NUS, the National University Sing of Singapore, um, to really uh, develop um, innovation there um, to help uh, be more efficient. So like, um, I, I sort of add on to what Miriam said there. Like there's a lot of, um, <clears throat> physics problems that you can solve to actually make, you know, groundbreaking sort of innovations in the space, right? So like the cooling thing is absolutely a great example. Like, you know, how much heat can you transfer 
uh, mm -hmm. from you know like wasted heat to actually useful heat to maybe like you know, heat from data centers to boiling water, right? Things like that, very powerful. Um, battery energy density, how mm -hmm. much can I store you know on a single sort of cell? Like that's a big problem as well because if you can improve that, you can actually tap onto the grid during sort of low demand periods and then service you know the sort of um, uh, the building during high demand periods. So things like those definitely move the needle. I think a lot of what we are doing is, you know, tapping onto that, but also structuring the product around it, because these are, you know, end of the day, sort of scientific breakthroughs, but how you productize it is a whole other ball game. And so for, for our space specifically, I can give context, like within IoT, one of the big changes we saw was the introduction of low powered wide area networks, um, mm -hmm. so specifically technologies like LoRa, um, Sigfox, which is proprietary, uh, and then there's a couple of others like NBIOT and all that. Um, and so for us, this was kind of a breakthrough because we could install or retrofit sensors to collect data that we didn't have at a mm -hmm. very cheap rate. Like we didn't need wiring. We didn't need to sort of, you know, disrupt operations. We could wirelessly install something that survives for five years yeah. collects data or interacts with a mechanical system. And, you know, you can get that done in like minutes, which wasn't possible before. And what that meant is if you're an existing building, we can retrofit you, get the data we need, um, and, you know, actually automate sort of the building, you know, straight away, like within like that day, um, which, you know, which, we, which is, again, purely because of that sort of breakthrough in LP RAN that we managed to sort of build a whole, you know, stack on top of it to make that possible. So, um, there are certain breakthroughs, I think, in sort of the physical space, of course, in sort of the networking and technology space. But mm -hmm. end of the day, it comes down to people productizing it. Like if you can't really productize it, it won't actually have any value to the customer. And I think that's really what um, to, goes to Miriam's point, which is, you know, like how do you take that and structure it in a way where like you can finance it, you can install it, somebody can come mm -hmm. in and service it. And so I think a lot of what we're doing now is very much around this. Right, right. No, I totally agree with that. I think ultimately, um, you know, you can have like the most growing technology, but if you can't bring it to the ground and implement, um, there is no use to, to the technology. Stanley, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, um, we last year, we just um, created a new JV, uh, the third derivative with the Rocky Mountain Institute. And two of the main focuses is um, industrial energy efficiency and also buildings. And there's been a number of interesting um, companies coming out of that. Uh, for example, Rebound Technologies, they developed a freeze point suppression system to um, enable food processors and cold storage processors to um, be able to be more efficient, right? So this is like one of those um, deep tech technologies that really enable a, a huge range of um, uh, industrial players to be a lot more efficient, right? Um, so I'll, I'll post like a link to like the um, companies that we're working with there. You could sort through industrial and buildings and get some more ideas as well. And um, I, I think next uh, in, in the Q&A box, you know, there's also a few questions related to um, battery swapping technology and electric vehicle. And, and that also brings me um, to my next um, so-called question to, to the panelists um, to really understand from your point of view, right? Um, beyond just um, implementing energy efficiency solutions to optimize um, consumption, um, what do you see the role of this um, technology or, or solutions in enabling integration of other um, sustainable technologies, um, in this case, um, renewables or electric vehicle or any other technologies in the market today? Um, so I think on that one, I mean, I, I don't think that necessarily the energy efficiency technology would, uh, would enable that. I think for me, it's, those are parallel stream of things that need to be enabled by, by different, uh, let's say, uh, factors or enablers. Um, for the renewable energy side of things and the electric vehicle side of things, today it's really government driven. Um, mm -hmm. The government of Singapore is really, uh, you know, uh, launching tenders and, and, and encouraging corporate uh, to invest into those solutions and then develop them. 
whereas I think energy efficiency is, is more of a, a corporate by corporate type type of, uh, of uh, action today. Um, this being said, I think there are more and more corporate that are also thinking of ways to, um, you know, to valorize their, uh, their roofs or their uh, space if they have any land or roofs to install uh, solar power and sell back that power to the grid um, and, and, and so contribute in a way to, to the greenification of, of that grid. Um, so, so for me, those are more like, uh, I would say, uh, different parallel stream that would need to be enabled by different uh, type of, of uh, regulation, probably mm -hmm. and, and renewable, whereas um, energy efficiency is, I think, more uh, ways to uh, invent new business model, look at way to financing it um, to make sure that companies uh, start implementing, uh, implementing them. Um, yeah, I'll also comment. I with all these sort of corporate net zero announcements, um, obviously it's going to take like a multi prong approach, right? Um, but you know, I, I would definitely, if if it was me, I would definitely start with looking at energy efficiency, right? Like, how can you take a look at using less so you have to, you know, you don't have to um, generate more to cover for that, right? So obviously that like energy efficiency is always like kind of um underlooked by like, overlooked right um in terms of like the first go-to solution yeah thanks thanks for that um jumping on to the sorry sorry is there anything you wanted to add no no just okay ahead. all right just just um addressing the next um question we have that i thought would be interesting right is is on um talent i think there is a question here that you know as we see the sector growing um, and, and companies across all industry growing, do we see any skill gaps or challenges in recruiting people of certain profiles? Opening it to the floor. I mean, I think there's uh, always, <laughs> it's been always a case with I think most uh, countries where you do find it hard to get really good technology people, right? And that's because the, the amount of technology people being produced every year is much less than demand itself. And it only compounds, um, you know, when you sort of uh, look at smaller countries like Singapore, um, you know, like the foreign uh, talent pool that you need access to, to actually, you know, like grow the business versus the local talent pool that's available. That's always a challenge, especially when, you know, like you have big companies like um, TikTok or you know, like Tesla coming in, you know, they scoop up sort of what's available. And so like, it does get difficult uh, to mm -hmm. hire. So definitely a big challenge um but that being said like you know we have seen some really sort of uh good people locally um mm -hmm. come up into this space right like because people from overseas have returned back like oh singaporeans who are overseas working in these sectors have come back um or even like sort of attracting talent within sort of southeast asia because singapore is an attractive hub uh to work out of to live out of uh, and so all of those uh, things have definitely helped us uh, in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, with COVID now, obviously, it's a whole other situation. Like, we still need to, you know, get back to a, a, a sort of scenario where we can move freely. And I think that will happen sooner rather than later, obviously. Um, you know, that, that seems to be the plan. Um, so, yeah, like, I mean, uh, you know, like, one of the things that we should always consider is, like, you know, it, it, we, we can't sort of, um, not look at this as a global problem, right? So even though we might be based on Singapore, like we do have access to the world in a much more sort of easier fashion than it was before. And the way we take advantage of that is to look at, you know, specific institutes that produce, you know, talent in, in sectors that we work in, um, which might be overseas sort of uh, countries or even like, um, you know, sort of universities that have tie-ups with specific organizations. And so, um, it's really about targeting your effort. Like if you are really looking for data scientists, you know, um, you would probably look at places like France where there are a lot more data scientists than sort of the rest of the world for whatever reason, um, right? And then similarly, if you're looking at sort of designers, you might be looking at Berlin because there might be sort of a lot more that has come here. So it, it really sort of comes down to what kind of roles you're looking at and then mm -hmm. finding out, where, you know, which places or institutes produce that kind of talent and then just targeting your efforts there. 
uh, and then hopefully you either sort of are in a you know globally um, you you are a global company that you can sort of leverage that talent mm-hmm. um, or you know because Singapore is sort of open to bringing in a lot yeah. of tech people like you're able to sort of get them to move over and it's it's probably one of the best places to live <laughs> most people don't have a complaint there. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> If, if I can add, I would say also that uh, on our side, we have a, a lot of young folks in our team. And what we observe is that sustainability, decarbonization, energy efficiency, all these topics are, are more and more sexy for the young <laughs> generation. They see that really as, you know, they want well, to cause, they want a mission behind the job. And yeah. that really answers that. And so I think that that's what we observe, that uh, uh, attracting people is not, is not as difficult because of that mission. Yeah, purpose-driven job. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and just a comment about energy efficiency uh, skill sets specifically, like I mentioned, um, all those policies that um, will be, you know, enforced in the Philippines. Um, once you mandate, like, you have to have an energy manager and audit, right, every year, like, who, who, what, where is the workforce that is going to do that, right? Like, we're going to need thousands more energy managers, auditors, like, ESCO companies like doing these types of projects. Um, there's a great organization in Vietnam, the Energy Efficiency Network, they go into schools um, and then they're training energy efficiency like at a, a younger age, right? To, to help uh, universities and schools to build that capacity to, to be able to, to develop that talent. So that's just an example of um, a potential solution. So. Thank you, thank you. I hope that's helpful for, for some of um, the attendance, uh, attendees or audience here today. So we, we have spoken quite a bit about industries and, and businesses, right? What this uh, industries and businesses can do um, to adopt the solutions. I'm also curious to hear from our panelists today. Is there anything that individuals, right? Like me and you can, can do at a household level to look at energy efficiency? It's just being mindful of your actions. Or, or, <laughs> it's pretty much it. I mean, it, it, every bit adds up. So, you know, whatever yep. you can do, you know, be it recycling or, you know, be it, so making sure that you're not wasting energy when you're not around or like opting for sort of lower wattage uh, appliances, everything counts. Um, yeah. But yeah, like I think it's a combined effort. Like organizations have to do their part, individuals have to do their part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just just yeah. Much it. turn off the light when you go out of a room, don't have very long hot showers and things like that. But, but I, think, uh, I think although this is quite important for the cultural shift because you, you need really the mindset and the cultural uh, mindset to change for people to realize how important it is to actually, um, at, at the corporate le- level as well, uh, take care of these things. Uh, I think the, the impact would really come more from the industry at this point. Uh, at least that's where we should start, right? Because that's, that's much higher in terms of impact. Right. But the, the, the day-to-day things and the, uh, the, the things you can do at home help with the cultural shift and, and you yeah. know, yeah. make that a, an important aspect of, of your whole life. And aside from behavior change, um, it's about staying educated and understanding, right? Like, mm-hmm. what are the latest trends or technologies? Like, what are things that you can actually um, make decisions on, right? Like, how do you choose appliances? Like, all, all of these things, like, are what um, everyday consumers can 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 do. Yeah, um, thanks for that. And I'm trying to see if we can uh, maybe pick one more question from the Q and A to to um, address, and then um, we can wrap the session up. Let's see. I mean, there are quite a number of questions on regulatory changes. Um, I think maybe we can go on that. Um, there, there are a few questions on how we. Um, you know, the panelists can advise as to how companies can go about navigating regulatory challenges when it comes to um, pushing for um, energy efficiency deployment. Um, Any comments on that? I would say that at the industrial level, you might have a push coming from the fact that uh, Singapore will impose a carbon, I mean, has imposed already a carbon tax and that carbon tax will keep increasing. Uh, and so uh, high, po- high polluters would have to limit their emission under a certain level uh, or pay a higher carbon tax. And therefore, I think they would have an incentive to use any levers they can to reduce 
uh, their carbon emission and decarbonize and energy efficiency would be of course the first one. So at the from a regulation regulation standpoint, I think it would really act mostly on the on the higher uh, emission sector or the, the higher polluter uh, on the mm -hmm. small companies. Um, I think I mean from the maybe from the incentive incentive standpoint. So if you have grants or things like that, that would help uh, companies move forward. But I don't think that um, you would have uh, regulation forcing companies, at least not on the short term. To, uh, to implement uh, energy efficiency measures um, for, for smaller and smaller companies with less uh, impact on the carbon budget of the country. Right, right. And there, there is work being done in the space. You guys quoted IEA before. They, every year they run an energy efficiency training in Southeast Asia for policymakers who are in charge of energy efficiency policy, right? And we participated in a couple of those in the past years. Um, it's a great way to engage um, the policymakers, getting them to share um, success stories and ideas of things that they can do to, to implement. So, I mean, I know um, the whole regulatory ch change takes a long time, right? And it's not an easy process, but, you know, it, it is being driven forward. Um, but what everyone else can do as well is also to, you know, um, signal to your uh, government and leaders that you, you would like to see this change happen. Yeah. I think I agree with both of those points. And, uh, you know, like it, it does play a part, like where if you start seeing, you know, additional taxes or, you know, like um, fees that you have to pay for not, you know, doing your part, I think that is probably the best uh, enabler or push because end of the day all of these are businesses and they do look at sort of things they can do to improve their PNL and it comes down to that and I don't think we should shy away from that like I think just accepting the fact that you know uh, you know if you can show that sustainability can be profitable um, that's going to be the fastest way to get people to change and I think that's where governments can play their part uh, being the self regulatory bodies so yeah right right Thank you for, for all the insights. I think this has been a really interesting conversation and um, unfortunately we're coming to, to the close of the event. And um, before we, we conclude, I think um, I would just give the opportunity to our panel, panelists here to, to add their concluding remark and, and I will also pose the questions on top of that, you know, to just hear from you, what do you hope to see, right, in terms of adoption or deployment related to energy efficiency in the next three to five years? So for, I think for us personally, the vision is that, you know, we want to make it super easy for any type of building to retrofit their operations and mm -hmm. be the most sort of energy efficient, productive and sustainable version of themselves. Um, so that's what we are working on. So today we are targeting hotels, but for us, you know, we want to go into pretty much every vertical out there, um, you know, offices, mixed use, residential, uh, malls, you know, it can be anything. And so for us, you know, we want to work on that sort of technical innovation so that we can go to any of these buildings and say, here's a solution. You know, you can retrofit that in five minutes and then you can just be the best version of yourself. So that's that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. My, my goal is just to invest in Sai and make him successful. <laughs> <laughs> um, but seriously, um, I think we need a lot more um, size and sensor flows, right? Like in every country, uh, the reason why we're doing this energy efficiency accelerator, uh, the dream would be to roll that out in every country, right? Supporting um, batches of new companies, like pushing the technology business models in energy efficiency going forward. Um, and that's the, that's my dream. And I think on, on our side, uh, the goal would be that every company consider energy efficiency as something that needs to be implemented because it's not only bringing uh, carbon savings, but also um, economies, right? So there is no reason not to do it. And so I think we would like to see every company, not only the big ones, but also the smaller ones, uh, starting to, to implement that kind of measures. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sai, Stanley, Miriam. And with that, we have come to the end of the session. I, I hope this conversation has provided some good insights um, on how energy efficiency solutions can play a part to meet our carbon reduction goals. Um, I hope we all can do our part, however big or small, to, to save our planet before it's too late. 
Thank you again um, to our panelists and to the audience. Thank you for attending and staying till the end. I'll hand over the session back to Amy. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Hui, for moderating the panel. And wow, it is really not every day that we see that there's just so much interest being generated from the audience. Um, the number of questions, great questions from the crowd, and our speakers also has been um, very engaging and answering a lot of questions on their own that is in the Q&A box as well. So I definitely hope that our audience uh, managed to get as many uh, of their question marks answered today. That being said, I uh, also still like to represent SG Innovate to thank all the attendees who have stayed with us till now. And a big thank you once again to Hui and all our speakers, uh, Stanley, Sai, Miriam. Uh, great insights and discuss discussion points, definitely. Uh, and for attendees, uh, do keep a lookout for our post-event mail, uh, which will record, uh, contain a recording of this session and do reach out to us at event at sginnovate.com if you'd like to connect with uh, any of our speakers or just to have a chat with us for collaboration opportunities. Do also remember to give us your post-event feedback when you exit the webinar or through the post-event mail as well. With that, uh, this is Wei Min signing out from this webinar. Hope that everyone will have a great day ahead. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, hope to have you again on our next webinar session. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.